cold weather and the risk for cold injuries to the hands and feet can be crippling for workers in the military. Is it possible to predict who might be at greatest risk, and can you train to reduce these risks? In today's episode, we'll explore a study testing the hand rewarming response of Swedish soldiers before and after 15 months of training. Were there any commonalities amongst those who had cold injuries? Did their hand response to cold exposure improve after the 15 months? If you're anything like me, it's not so much your body getting cold that limits your cold tolerance, but how cold your hands and feet feel. For those who have no choice about going indoors, like linemen fixing power lines after a snowstorm, or soldiers, the risks for cold injuries to the hands and feet are very real. Indeed, during the Second World War and fighting in Western Europe, it was estimated that 10% of American casualties were actually due to cold injuries like frostbite. Given this risk, there is a lot of interest in both predicting who might be most at risk for cold injuries, and also in ways to reduce these risks. In lab studies, repeated exposure of the hands to the cold have largely been ineffective in improving cold response. However, what about long-term natural exposure to cold environments? In 2008, a study was done testing Swedish soldiers before and after 15 months of ranger training, lasting through two winters from January 2003 to March 2004. 77 soldiers took part in the study, and the testing involved putting the hand in cold 10 degrees Celsius water for 10 minutes, then drying and letting it naturally rewarm over 30 minutes while an infrared camera was used to track finger temperatures. The soldier's rewarming response was categorized as normal, moderate, or slow, depending on how much finger rewarming occurred over the 30 minutes. Over the 15 months, the soldiers kept record of cold sensations of the hands, along with being regularly checked for cold injuries. After training, 45 of these soldiers were retested. Smoking history and also where they grew up were recorded to see whether smoking or home climate while growing up affected results. There were definitely differences in rewarming between the soldiers, with 17 and 17 of the 77 soldiers rated as slow and moderate, respectively. There were five cases of cold injuries in the group overall, and interestingly, four out of these five cases were in slow rewarmers. This isn't conclusive, but it does support another study in Dutch soldiers prior to Arctic exercises, showing that those who developed cold injuries were mostly those with poor cold screening responses beforehand. The other interesting finding was that both the slow and the moderate rewarming groups had better responses after the 15 months of training, with greater degree of rewarming after cold exposure. However, the slow group still remained worse than the moderate or the normal group. No relationship was found with regards to smoking history or hometown climate. This study is interesting because it suggests that long-term, natural exposure to cold can indeed improve our cold tolerance. This is in stark contrast to the lack of change with lab training studies. So there's something unique about natural adaptation that scientists remain unclear about. This would also suggest that we're at greatest risk for cold injuries at the start of winter rather than at the end, and so this would be the best time for public education. And if a simple screening test is possible, this can greatly aid medical and safety planning for workers and the military. I hope that this study doesn't leave you out in the cold about environmental physiology. I'm Professor Stephen Chung, and I run the Environmental Ergonomics Lab in the Department of Kinesiology at Brock University. We post new videos on different topics in environmental physiology every Wednesday. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.